Hello, welcome back to the YouTube channel of Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. This is another video on a historic Staffordshire church. This is the church of St. Peter Norbury, Staffordshire. Not to be confused, of course, with any of the other Norburys in Britain, particularly not Norbury in Derbyshire. Norbury, of course, simply means uh, North, Burr North, Fortified Settlement, and so it's a pretty common name. It's like Newcastle, which just means well, Newcastle. But Norbury, Staffordshire, has a, its own appeal, and in some ways there are similarities between Norbury, Staffordshire, and Norbury, Derbyshire, in that it's another medieval church in a country setting near a manor house. Now, here the manor house is gone, it's been demolished. The church is much smaller, the church has its origins in the, tw in the 12th century, although as we see it today, it's very largely a product of a rebuilding in around about uh, 1340 or so, so the middle of the 14th century. It's also been altered in the 18th century and the 19th century, and we'll see some of the, the features as we go around. So here we are, it's a, as you can see, it's a Fairly simple building, it's nave, chancel, and there's a tower, but it hasn't got any of your aisles, transepts, anything like that. It has a, an appeal all its own. It's made of the local red sandstone, which is quite attractive, particularly on the outside, and even the inside, the stonework is actually quite good, and so it's one of these cases where one isn't too annoyed with the Victorians for taking all the plaster off, but you know me. I'm always annoyed with the Victorians taking the plaster off because who knows what was on that plaster when it was taken off. Probably medieval wall paintings, but did the Victorians care? Apparently not. So let's have a look around and there's got a, a bit of history around here, so let's explore. So as usual, we begin at the West End and we start off, you can see a nice Quite a long nave, it's what say four bays because we've got south doorways, south and north doorways that occupy one of the bays. So you've got three windows either side and a door in the middle. We have a vestry here with uh, generous panelled internally, so it's a, an internal space, not an external one. And we have this really lovely font dated 17. 38, I think. It's hard to tell. Is it is that a 3 or a 5 down here? It's a 5, so 17... No, it's a 3. 1738. Um, hard to tell with the script they use, but nice example of a quite a robust rural version of your... what's known as a bird bath font for rather obvious reasons. You come in through the west door, and you can see this is a big... Um, late 18th, early 19th century door. It relates to a tower that was put in at the same time. There would have been a gallery here at one point, and you can see here there's where the gallery door was. All filled in now, because there's no gallery, and you wouldn't want that kind of health and safety risk, although some churches have them anyway. The pews appear to be at least partially made of the old box pews, which is always nice. You can see here that the south doorway, which would originally have been the main entrance, is now completely blocked off. You can't use it. North door, again, completely blocked off. Got an Easter garden there. The women coming to the tomb, he is not here, for he has risen. Big organ. 19th century, of course, as most of these organs are. In fact, almost all of them are. You'll see here in the pews, we have heating. Not quite sure putting the heating there is the best idea, but there we are. The pulpit at least appears to incorporate some Jacobean panels and is of wood, thankfully. Wood is always appreciated in pulpits. We have a, a nice two-manual organ, Conacher of Huddersfield. Conacher, quite a well-known organ manufacturer. Very nice. Um, and it seems to have come here as late as 1968, although it may very well not have been built for this church. Quite often you're looking at reuse of something that was built for somewhere else. Just looking west here, we can see that rather unfortunate scar there. I mean, while most of the walls, these nice big blocks of stone, that looks quite, quite attractive. Um, up there, it's a mixture of brick, because that's, of course, where they put the, when they put the tower up. And really, that should be covered up. The, the roof is medieval. It's what's known as a wagon roof, because it has this appearance like the inside of a covered wagon. 
nice windows again, 14th century. Bit of uh, and the glass mostly. There's only only a little bit of stained glass, and you can see the east window doesn't have any, but the side windows in the chancel do. We have here um, a couple of healings, and here we have a uh, lot. Uh, we have um, Melchizedek blessing Abraham. This, of course, is a faux medieval window, and so they've got Abraham as a, an armored knight. And then next to them you have the the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper. We have uh, some medieval memorials here. These are members of the, the Butler family, uh, or Wattler family, who were who lived in the manor house. I so say the manor house is gone now. Up there we have uh, funerary helm and gauntlet. At one point the actual armour of knights would be displayed when they were buried, but of course armour armor's expensive and so often what they'd actually do is they'd have something made that was just kind of a replica armour, just thin metal or even wood and it's just there to impress and say this is a, a, a knight's tomb and so here we have these, these two butlers, one of them is clearly in a much better state than the other one and he's the older one, he is you can see this chap here as we, we come in here the, this chap, and the paint is a, a really good thing to find because very often the paint has been lost with these uh, effigies. It, it's been restored, of course, but they would have been painted like this. You can see he is in chainmail, not in not in plate armour at all. He, he's pictured drawing his sword. Now the idea here is simply that this makes him look like he's he's alive. This is just a, a way of making the image look more. Um, to say lifelike, yes, lifelike, um, and animated. And of course, he's got a lovely, lovely lion under his feet. I do, do like these medieval lions because, of course, the artist had no idea what a real lion looked like. Not out here. His tomb, the tomb recess here, is very really good. Uh, has been restored in the 19th century, but quite well. And up there again, we've got these. You can see up there, there's another wagon roof, but we've got this uh, funerary helm and gauntlet. And then this other knight here, he's a bit later because he's. He's got some plate armour on. He's got his um, hasn't got his great helm. He's got his head resting on his great helm, and uh, bit the worst for well, He's not in the original position, and he's in separate pieces. But you can see here, just get round to back there, under his head, or rather under his head end, under his head, he's got his great helm. That's what he'd wear when he was riding into battle, and then he's got his. Uh, under helm there, and on his uh, on his breast he has the cross of St Chad, the, the sign of Lichfield Diocese, among other things. But also, of course, that design was used by the Crusaders. Is he a Crusader knight? Could be. But you can see the development of armour from the, the simple chain mail to here. He's there's a, a good amount of plate, but you've still got a bit of chain. You've got his this nice. Um, chainmail cowl he's got which protects his chin and everything and then he's got his great helm goes over the top and one of the great things you can do with this sort of uh, effigy is you can see how armour styles develop now when it comes to, to men we know a lot more about what knights wore in battle what armour looked like in the middle ages than we do about what these men would have worn at home because of course if you're a knight you're depicted in armour on the other hand their ladies are depicted in the very best of their dresses. I mean, look at look at this one. This is another one of the butlers, and the folds of her dress. And then you've got another butler here in a brass. She again. In the Middle Ages, women covered their hair. It was very very rare for, well, certainly noble women would always cover their hair. So. You watch your, your Robin Hood. Well, is it the Errol Flynn Robin Hood where Maid Marian always has a headdress on? Well, that is historically accurate. As is a lot about that film, actually. I mean, people are sniffy about Errol, the Errol Flynn Robin Hood. But actually, the Errol Flynn Robin Hood is... OK, it, it's, it's not all historically accurate, but the, the bright colours, the, the clothes... There's been a lot of research gone into it. And here we, we can see the sort of thing that that your fashionable medieval lady would wear. I mean, again, she's got a head covering, um, quite a uh, shaped bodice. 
fitted to her, her body. Um, probably a bit uncomfortable to wear, but this is your formal wear, of course. This is what you would wear as um, entertaining at these, these parties. And, and of course, the men would be wearing not their armour, they would wear colourful clothes as well. But we're not shown what the men were. You can see looking west, nice. It's a big building. But of course, this is a small village. You don't need a massive, broad building. So you build upwards, and it just carries the eye up. And again, we have helm and gauntlet. We like these. And on the other hand, other side, we have another, another medieval lady, another butler lady, and it's a bit gloomy down where she is. But you can, you can just again see. This is a, a bit later, and she's got her hair up now. This one, you've still got that that t quite tight waist. I mean, that was again quite uncomfortable to wear, I would think. She's got a cloak on over it, got her hair up in these um, nets now. Medieval fashion victims. And here we have the sedilia. And the sedilia should be lower down, or should be higher up. I mean, you can't really sit in those. So this tells us that the, the floor level here has been raised quite spectacularly. We've got a number of memorials in the floor. Here is John Bickford of Alton, late mathematical master of the Greycoat Hospital, Westminster, who departed this life September the 7th, 1804, age 46. Greycoat Hospital was a charity school. I believe the building still exists um, and is owned by the National Trust. Up here we have, you just see here there's a, the base of a, well, really it's a, a bracket, they have statues either side here, I'm trying to think of the word now. Um, and here we have a memorial to the Reverend Sambrook Higgins, MA, who died July the 16th. 1823, aged 89, had been wrecked of this parish 65 years. There was no retirement in those days. Basically, if you're an Anglican clergyman, you, you could kind of hope that you might get a, a cannery where you didn't have to do anything. But for the most part, you'd have to stay in parish ministry until you died. Reader, attend. Let simple truth impart the sterling virtues of his generous heart. Honest and upright, few are left behind, so just in principle, so pure in mind. In plain sincerity he passed his life, envious of none and free from care or strife. Faithful to God, benevolent to man, he always acted on the Christian plan. Strive then to emulate his virtues rare, and for a blessed eternity prepare. Very typical of this non-evangelical clergy at the time, that what you would do is, you talk about their virtues, how these people were, were virtue, how this gentleman is a virtuous man. And here we have these heads on the sedilia. They're rather fun again. You've got, uh, a, there's a, a bearded man, there's a bishop, there's a lady there, there's another clergyman, and then you've got a layman at the end. And these things, although they're not 100% accurate to life, they give us a good idea of what people wore in the Middle Ages. Here we have a whacking great memorial, I mean, golly. Um, Carolus Scrimshire, so Charles Scrimshire Knight. It's all in Latin, you say. Uh, he's Charles Scrimshire Knight. Um, now we are told from a uh, Scottish family, um, yes, Scrimshire, Scottish, and uh, we are told that. Uh, died in 1708 at the age of 56. There we are. And you've got all these coats of arms, of course, because this is a, a true and noble knight. We're no longer in the days when true and noble knight had one of these, but he's still got to have his coats of arms to show his uh, position, his importance. It's a, an interesting building, this one. It's not very far off the, the road to from Eccleshall to Newport, so it's not, not that difficult to find, it, but it does feel like you're in the middle of nowhere, and you kind of are in the middle of nowhere. Well, I think that's the inside, really. The, the big thing here is the effigies at the east end. So we'll pause here, and we're going to have a look at the outside. Before we go outside, actually, we'll pause in the tower, because uh, this is a l late 18th century addition, and we can see here you've got this big door, you've got the 
It's always a good thing to find the parish chest with its multiple locks. And the stairs that originally led to the gallery, but of course there is no gallery anymore. So that's inside the tower, so we'll continue then outside. And so here we are outside at Norbert. I'm going to try not to trip over too much in the churchyard. Um, it's surrounded by this quite nice churchyard. You can see here, immediately you've got your lovely medieval church with its made out of this beautiful, beautiful sandstone. And then you've got this Georgian tower, this brick tower stuck on the west end, because that's what you do after all. So they wanted a tower. I don't think it had a medieval tower. Every indication is it probably didn't. Not all medieval churches did, and may have had one. But that's a nice Georgian tower. And you see this good stone works out. It's, it's red sandstone, it's relatively soft, so a bit crumbly around the edges these days. But that just adds to its charm. So we'll have a look around and point out some of the more salient features. And so we begin here in the corner of the churchyard. The churchyard becomes a sea of nettles in parts in the summer, so it's good to get here in the spring when it's still entirely navigable. I have been here in the summer and it's kind of impressive in its own way. Got this collection of memorials called the South Side is where most of the burials would have been. But in the Middle Ages, the North Side was kind of reserved for people who were illegitimate and um, children born, children who died before baptism, that kind of thing. Um, and those who died excommunicate, of course. And this nice uh, south doorway, that would originally have been the main entrance. Priest's door at the side here. What we'll do is we'll... And the reason we're doing it from this angle is because that's it's actually one of the best views is from this angle. A whacking great east window, it's always nice. Um, I do like this red sand, so you can see quite a rural setting, all those cows over there. <laughs> As we come around here, I've always got to keep one eye on the path and one on the camera, because if I take my path too much, I shall fall over. If I keep my the camera, I shall find that the camera is pointing at something completely um, well, unnecessary. It's rather good, look. Angels blowing their trumpets. This is a, a little Victorian vestry organ chamber, and it's the, the last addition to the building. North side, again north doorway. You can see there's you no know, burials along the north side, at least not visible burials. There probably are some medieval ones under here, but they wouldn't mark them, because they didn't in the Middle Ages. Yeah, this church was thoroughly repaired in the years AD 1826, 27, 28, 29 by the liberality of landlords and tenants, united in the kindest manner to place the house of God in the parish in a state becoming its sacred character. So this is 1826. Yeah, I mean those, those heads. Um, and you can see that the stone here is less eroded, but again, this soft, soft sound, so it does tend to erode quite readily, as you can see. The north door, unusual in that there's actually a door there. Normally, they just lock it up, but here they actually just, they've left the lower, the, the upper part of the door, the lower part tends to rot, and they've just whacked some stone in. Quite interesting, nice, nice glass in the windows and again this this nice 18th century tower just, just a hint of gothic i won't look up here because the sun is in the wrong place for that and here we are entrance because today the main entrance is as we saw through the tower and has been since the 18th century since this tower was built there's a date on it but I don't see one got to be careful with the, the sun, where the sun is here, but as if there was a medieval tower, there's no trace of it left. But then there wouldn't be if this has been this uh, 18th century tower had been built on the site, would there? At one point, you've looked over there and you've seen this whacking great manor house, but that's all, all been demolished now. Um, and here we are 
south side and again it's this lovely eroded stonework and one of the things about this red south is it weathers nicely it becomes quite soft around the edges shall we say but yeah this is all basically medieval stonework that's a medieval door in there or at least a 17th century one so all very 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 good that buttress has definitely been restored but then of course these things have to be because they erode they rot away well there we are that's uh, St Peter's Norbury and so here we are Norbury there you go St Peter's it's very different of course from the Derbyshire Norbury has its own beauties. I apologise for the sound of the chainsaw in the background. That's what you get in the countryside sometimes. But so thank you for watching and may God bless you and keep you until the next time.